two. We are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and we call this little show the Studio Q Show Live, meaning that a lot of people watch this afterward, but um, and not everybody can make it during these times. So you can watch it on YouTube. We're streaming on Facebook now on the Wet Plate Collodion Group that I put up years ago there. Um, so we should have a good turnout today on this broadcast, I hope. So we will get rolling right along. Um, I was going to share, for those that are interested, I was going to share this here. Um, get everybody in here. Good morning, uh, Guten Tag, uh, Sasha. Good to see you, brother. We are well. Hello, Jan from Norway. Good vibes as well. Yes. And Oliver's here. We're going to talk about Oliver from Deutschland today. And Will, thank you for joining us, brother. That's always good. To, it's always good to see you in here. We're going to go ahead and share this. I'm going to share. People have been asking about my house. Um, so I'll share a couple of photos. Here's the empty living room. Hey, Don <laughs> from Central Texas. Good to see you. Here's the empty living room in the kitchen. Um, we're just, we got our TV over here in the corner, but uh, it's beautiful. I'll show you a couple of views here too. Not that they're great. I just snapped these a minute ago. I thought uh, a couple of people asked me, can you show us some photos of your house? And there's the view from the sliding window. There's the view from the kitchen window uh, just two minutes ago. And there's one of the first things that I did. I, I hung my Edward Curtis print, my um, Mosa print, which is beautiful. It's a lot bigger than it looks here. It's a 20 by 24, but it's a prominent place in the, in the hallway. Greetings from the Netherlands. Good to see you, Facebook user. Show us our bedroom. <laughs> I love it. Que bueno, Pablo. Que bueno. Um, you know, your bedroom is actually a private out on the um, outback pad. Uh, it's a nice place. Our old, hi, hello from the, uh, from the Netherlands, I believe he is. Um, Van der Ah, I'm not sure how you say his last name. And Paul in the UK, great. Maybe I can get to share your stuff today. And uh, Linda too, good to see you, Linda. Awesome. Okay, three minutes of greeting and playing around. Uh, but that's our house. That's uh, that's where we live now, and it's beautiful. I gotta admit, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. We are lucky to be here. So today we've got we got some good stuff. I think um, every time um, I have a chance to jump online and look at stuff, I try to see catch the vibe that's going around in the community, and it's really strange. There are these movements that move through the community. Um, and lately I've had inquiries and people asking about boiling silver baths. So we're gonna talk about that in depth today and kind of clear the air about this thing and make sure that people understand if they do that, the risks they are taking and what it means. And we're only gonna look at it from the scientific point of view. I'm not gonna, this isn't my opinion, this isn't, you know, they did it in the 19th century, and we'll look at that as well, too. This is just science. This is just fact. And then you can decide if you want to do that or not. Um, a lot of people do that. Who needs a TV if you can have three rifles? Brother, man, that is just the beginning. You would not believe what I have. So we'll just say that uh, there are mountain lions and bears um, I'm armed up here just walking around the property because you are on the food chain here. You are on the food chain. <laughs> Unlike the urban dwellers. And maybe maybe urban dwellers are on the food chain in a different way too. I don't know. But uh, who needs a TV, right? We just got our TV yesterday. We haven't had a TV. So thank you, Pablo. Congrats. I appreciate that. Uh, Jean says, hi, Quinn. Jean from France, no snow, unfortunately. Oh, well, we have a tiny, tiny bit of snow, but an abundant amount of sunshine. So uh, today we're going to be, no, oh, about seven degrees Celsius, eight degrees Celsius, something like that. 
So it's a beautiful day. It's gorgeous. Um, so let's get on with the show. We're going to go ahead and do this uh, broadcast. We've already doubled the amount of people just by doing the Facebook book. book uh, fa blah, blah, blah. Easy for me to say. <laughs> face bag feed. Or I'm sorry, Facebook. I call it face bag. But either way you want to go. So good. Thank you for joining us. I'm serious. Um, Let's share the screen and get on with our regular kind of uh, show today. Again, like I said, we're going to uh, cover um, some of these uh, subtleties in this stuff. So uh, hold on. We'll get through it. And you guys, will, I'm sure you will get something out of this. So today's January 23rd, 2021. Um, and uh, you've already seen this. Uh, I'm going to start sending these screenshots out. I did add one thing, email this week. I got an enormous amount of email, which is a good thing. And those are the things we're talking about today. I'll be interested to hear your comments on what our Alfred brothers um, uh, say about uh, the positive process. I can get I have 10 people in this uh, feed now, the live feed. So I'm going to try to get uh, as many people in here as I can. So, so here we go. Let's start off. So last week we talked about um, making negatives, and he did a more comprehensive overview of that versus making positives. But this is very interesting. And I picked out some key points um, about how he's presenting making uh, positives. Um, and I think you'll find this interesting. Now, keep in mind, this book, this edition of this book was published in 1892. So way, well, several years past the prime of wet collodion. And I love this first line. The positive collodion process was for many years very popular, meaning that by, eight, by the time he published this book in the 1890s, it had fallen um, out of favor for most wet collodion photographers. And in that, there was dry plate, there was, we're, we're coming up just a few years away from the Brownie, the Kodak, you push the button, we do the rest kind of stuff. So we're right there in the tipping, uh, changing phase, we're, we're moving over. And uh, I, I just thought it was interesting. He says, for many years, it was very popular. Very beautiful results may be obtained, almost equal, almost equal in quality to the daguerreotype and without the disadvantage of the silver reflecting surface. Meaning, if you, you guys know what daguerreotypes are, that kind of me mirror, memory, mirror with the memory, as they call it, you have to kind of get the daguerreotypes just right and have something black shining back. And they're, they're, they're fun to look at, but he's right. Um, the disadvantage of the silver reflecting surface. Obviously, this, this person didn't like that. The difference between the positive and negative images is that the positive requires to be viewed by reflected light. Remember, I always talk about this, negatives, transmitted light, you're pushing light through the glass and looking at it. So transmitted light on a light table or light. And this, positives, we're backing it with something black and using the reflected light. That's what gives it that quality. Um, it's also a negative when looked at through the film. Yes, a very thin negative. But too, uh, yeah, there you go, but too weak to be used as a negative. Um, the negative image can only be judged by inspecting it by transmitted light. The increased density of the film takes away the positive effect. In other words, if you have a good negative, it won't show as a good positive. You can have what I call bright ambrotypes. In my book, I talk about this a lot. Bright ambrotypes or ambrotypes that are overexposed by a stop, stop and a half, maybe a tiny bit more. They're really bright as they're reflected light back with something black and reflected. They're very bright and sometimes silvery bright or warm bright. And those will look like a decent negative sometimes, like a decent film negative with transmitted light. And they will print quite well on modern developing out or develop out paper like Ilford, Kodak, any of the modern papers, right? The silver gelatin papers not the pop papers necessarily, with the exception of like oil prints. And there, there's, some, there's some printing out processes that you can actually use on bright ambrotypes. But 
it must be tra uh, viewed, the negative must be viewed by transmitted light. The increased density of the film takes away the positive effect. There are some differences in the manipulation, obviously. The collodion may be thinner. We'll talk about that in a second. Having less nitrocellulose. The silver bath may be the same as for negatives, but the developing solution can be varied in many ways. The uh, ferrous sulfate, uh, 10 grains, nitric acid, two drops, and an ounce of water will give good results. The exposure must be carefully timed and the development not be pushed as far as negatives. Really vague, really like, ah, I'm not really into this, but here's, here's a couple of tips. Nitrocellulose, the, the collodion, the plain USP collodion that we use to make our film or emulsion or uh, surface uh, uh, binder, if you will, the collodion, is 4 to 8% nitrocellulose. And remember that you need 5% or more to make uh, collodio chloride or aristotype pop prints. I talk about that quite a bit. 4% usually won't do it. You'll have all kinds of problems. But for positives, direct positives, ambrotypes, tintypes, that 4% or the least amount of nitrocellulose you can get away with um, uh, will work just fine for positives. The clothing may be thinner. The silver bath may be used the same as negatives. Remember his silver bath was a 35 grain or a 7 point, um, 78 grams of silver nitrate to a liter, 7.8%. Um, that's quite low. Uh, well, not well, considering 9%, most people use 9%. But the developing solution can be varied. So let's break that developing solution down. Um, 29 mils of water, a little over a half a gram, a gram of ferrous sulfate, and two drops of nitric acid. No alcohol, no nothing, no, you know, no, uh, uh, well, you got the acid there, right? The restrainer, you got the reducer and the restrainer, period. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about the timing must be uh, carefully timed. So uh, he doesn't really give any spe thing specific here. We give some guidelines of 15 seconds, adjust your exposure, don't ever, uh, 15 to 20 seconds development time, adjust your exposure, not your chemistry um, kind of thing. And obviously <laughs> it's not going to be pushed so far as for negatives because at the end of the day, you'll have veiling and scumming on the plate, right? You'll develop that unexposed silver on the top of the plate if you go too long. We all know that. Supposing a portrait to have been taken as soon as the outline of the drapery can be well seen, the development has proceeded far enough. So let's translate that into kind of modern English. Let's say you have a backdrop and you have a fold in that backdrop. Once you can see the definitions in those shadow areas, it's transition to the shadow area. That's what he's talking about. That should appear in 15 to 20 seconds normally if your chemistry is right. I have never tried this particular developer recipe. I, I'm going to do all of these things here in a little bit. Once I get my stuff set up, I won't just be talking about it. I'll be presenting images and, and studies and notes about taking this information and actually putting it into, into practice and showing it to you. Um, so once you see that transition of shadow areas, once you can see a shadow area of a collar or something in the background that you know is dark or shadow, once that appears, you arrest the development. Supposing a portrait, um, oh, sorry, the resulting picture should have a silvery whiteness as contracted with a pale brown of a negative. Let me reread that. The resulting picture should have a silvery whiteness as contrasted with a pale brown of the negative. I've shown on these shows a lot of negatives. They're not fun to look at with reflected light. They're fun to look at with transmitted light. That's what he's talking about. A lot of my negatives are redeveloped with pyrogalic acid. It get, can sometimes give a red or brown tinge, or if I go long enough and hard enough, it'll just be black highlights and to clear glass kind of thing, the shadows. <clears throat> um, so he's talking about the brown of a negative. A positive may be viewed as such from either side of the glass, but when you see when seen through the glass, the effect is not quite as clear as when seen on the surface. But in the latter the case, the, but in the latter case, the picture is reversed. What he's saying here is you got a you got a piece of glass with a positive on it. You can look at it from either side, through the glass or on the surface. 
And he's saying that if you look at it through the glass, it's not quite as good as image or the quality isn't, which I find I kind of disagree with that a little bit. Sometimes you, it's just beautiful to peer, peer through that glass. But he says the advantage of doing that is that your image is now it's not laterally reversed. Your the text on your shirt reads right. The the the, the people see themselves as you know, uh, it's et cetera. It's not laterally reversed. Is what he's talking about there. So there's another little developer uh, to try for positives. Um, interesting. He talks about the the thinner collodion, which is it, which is interested interesting, and the, um, um and I'm interested in trying some of these things just to to test to see what he's talking about here. Then he goes from that to defects. So, so all he goes from boom, here's your collodion, here's your developer, here's a, basically an adjustment for exposure, and now we're gonna get right into the defects. In the practice of the wet collodion process, the operator will often meet with defects, the causes of which are not easily discovered. In most, case, in most cases, the cause will be that the bath is out of order. I have said this for almost 20 years, that most people's problems are either gonna come from the silver bath or something in the developer or technique. If it's chemistry, it's most likely going to be the silver bath. If it's uh, technique, it's mostly going to be in, the, in the, develop, uh, the technique of developing. I better go back here and take a look at you guys. Um, so at the end of the day, what we have is a, uh, is a very light overview, very minimal instructions of making positives. So, so you know in the 1890s, negatives were the king. I mean, that's, that's how you made your money. You could produce prints, multiple prints. You could, you know, all, all of it. And, and, and at the end of the day, they're, they're quite uh, – negatives are, um, you know, very versatile. I mean, the pop prints, the, the reproducibility, the quality of them all. So – so he says the silver bath is probably out of order if you're having problems, but in what way and what is the remedy? These are the questions which the most experienced, most experienced worker may not be able to answer. But usually after experience, the, the causes of most defects will be seen. And it's true there. So if you've worked in wet clothing for a number of years, you're still on this kind of learning curve. And it's still a little bit, of a mystery every time I get an email and an image and saying, what's wrong? I mean, you can you can look at it and, and see the typical stuff, but a lot of times you don't know what they're doing in their environment, what chemistry they've used and all those things. So it's very, what he's saying, it's very difficult to nail these problems down. And it is, you get the basics down after a while, but some of the, you, you'll hit a wall, you'll hit a wall at some point that just baffles you, why? Why did I go for so many weeks or months or even years, and now I can't make a clean image? You hit a wall. That's what he's talking about. Then he goes on to say, when the bath is newly made, there should be no difficulty of any kind. That's, that is a broad and bold statement, right? So if you have a new silver bath, not really paying attention to much of anything else in the process, you shouldn't have any problems. Um, oh, which in a, in a large way I agree with. But after time, it will become charged with ether and alcohol. He calls it spirit from, uh, the, charged with ether and spirit from the collodion and will, be pro and will probably be the cause of the place to look streaky. So it's interesting that he picks out solvent streaks over anything else. Um, <clears throat> and I talk about this in the book a lot. Once you have that bath, full of solvents, ether and alcohol, mainly alcohol because that kind of hangs around. The ether will kind of breathe off quickly, but it'll still be there. And the larger the plate, the more you're going to put in your bath every time you pour a plate and drop it. So once that becomes saturated with solvents, you're going to start getting what I call stri uh, solvent striation, streaks and marks and weird kinds of stuff that that double decomposition as it's laying down the silver can't it gets in the way of that. So he talks about the solvent, uh, solvent saturation. <clears throat> By leaving the plates rather longer in the bath, these defects will, defects will disappear. But after long use, it will be better to pour the solution into an evaporating dish, drive off the alcohol, 
and then add water to bring the bath to its proper strength. Notice he didn't say boiling or heating up the silver bath there. He says evaporating dish and drive off the alcohol. The bath by constant use will become weakened and fresh silver must be added. We know this. We can check the specific gravity, right? Um, <clears throat> so roughly the strength of the bath may be ascertained by the means of an argentometer. Isn't this interesting? So um, basically what you're doing here is you're titrating. We don't titrate with specific gravity, right? That's kind of a rude uh, elemental form of saying how much of this substance is in this in this liquid, so to speak, in this water. How much silver do we have in the water? This is actually a titration uh, titration technique that will actually separate and tell you a titration is a technique where a solution of a known concentration is used to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. So all he's saying there is make sure you know what your silver content is or roughly. <clears throat> um, is sufficient. The best advice is do not tamper with the bath. Simply add a fresh sil add fresh silver as required. Occasionally give it a few days rest, and it will be found to work well. That's very true. If pinholes appear on the developed plate, the cause probably is an excess of iodide. Absolutely true. Remember, we talk about this this saturating your bath with iodides, and then you cross this line where those actually precipitate and, and create, dissolve out on the surface of the film or the emulsion, the collodion, and create pinholes. It'll leave a little clear hole in your collodion. <clears throat> Water may be added to the solution filtered. This will remove some of the iodide. Uh, fresh and the solution filtered, this will remove, oh, will remove some of the iodide. Fresh silver must of course be added in proportion to the water use. All he's saying there, is it if, and it's happened to everybody here that's probably watching or listening to this if you've been practicing at any length of time you have your silver bath say you have a liter of it and you're down 800 or 700 mils you need to add 300 mils of distilled water well you go ahead and pour that in it goes in there and all of a sudden it turns milky and blue and and you're like, oh my god did i re ruin this no you didn't ruin it <clears throat> you're just precipitating or pulling out those those iodides out of the bath the easiest way to prevent that from happening is to add a little bit of silver nitrate to the water you're adding. And usually you want to do that anyway. I have a little method that I use um, that works very well. And that's that's basically all it is. Talking about bath maintenance. After very long use, it may be necessary to remove organic material from the bath. In this case, add sufficient carbonate of soda, baking soda, neutralize the acid and place a bottle in the sunlight for a few days Acidified with, acidify with nitric acid, uh, see that there's a sufficient silver in the solution and filter. He just, in, in two sentences, he just said, said, do heavy maintenance on your bath. That's basically, and you look in my book in chapter 10, you'll see heavy maintenance of how to do that with your silver bath. That's what he's saying there. <clears throat> and then the bath should be in good working condition. The addition of anything to the bath beyond what is required to make is not recommended. The more simple its composition, the better. So true. So true. Don't add, you know, don't add stuff to your bath at all and inadvertently as well too. And be careful of what you actually put in your bath as far as substrate goes, right? N not all things work well. And then he goes on to oyster shells randomly, just like, okay, goes from pinholes to now he's in oyster shells or oysters. In warm weather, when the plates have been Longer than usual in the in the dark, what I call plate holder. He says dark slide. A plate holder, a deposit of silver sometimes occurs, forming what are called oyster shells or markings. <clears throat> the use of blotting paper in the corner of the dark, dark slide or the plate holder is often uh, is often a remedy. Contact with the wood or the frame is almost certain to cause the markings in warm weather. Contact with an open wood frame in your plate holder with your silver pl your your plate in there with silver on it, definitely going to produce uh, oysters. And you'll always notice that the plate, you know, it's laterally versed, so the top is the bottom and the, the top is the bottom and the bottom is the top. You'll always see <clears throat> the oyster stains at the top of the plate because that's the bottom. And that's where gravity pulls that. And that's what he's talking about is this excess free silver rolling around. Wipe the backs of your plate off. You can put blotting paper down there to keep it away. And definitely use a polyurethane or some kind of varnish on your plate holder. 
um, if you have edges or ledges or corners, especially wood, but any material. If you have the silver strings, the, the silver wire, you don't need to do anything like that. That's not going to cause a problem. <clears throat> there are two kinds of fog. And then he goes on to, there are two kinds of fog. I don't call this fog. This is where uh, he and I would part ways on, on vernacular or verbiage. Fog is either caused by uh, something silver bath related and will not wipe off the plate or light leaks and will not wipe off the plate. Those are permanent. I call this veiling and we'll go on to read this. There are two kinds of fog which are sometimes troublesome. Fog may be caused either by too much light in the dark room. That is, that is true. That is fog or by the plate not being clean. And that could be too, but really what he's talking, we'll go on. This may be detected by its being entirely on the surface of the plate. And with care, when removed gently with a rubbing pad and limited underwater. So he's saying that that will actually remove the second one. The light will not be removed. That, that is, you reduce that silver, you're not going to remove that. The remedy for this is addition of the two, drop, two, a drop or two of pure nitric acid to the bath, right? So he's lowering the pH. And that will. It's interesting that he talks about fog in this context, that he's talking about wiping off. If you can wipe off the, on the surface of your plate and you see an image underneath that veiling, that means that unexposed silver was developed. You don't have enough restrainer in your developer. It's too warm. You went too long on development. Something happened there. If you go to wipe the, the, the veil or the, the covering off, you see your image under there and it will not wipe off, that is fog. That is light leaks, silver bath pH problems, et cetera, et cetera, or other silver bath problems. So he's really talking about veiling, but it's okay. We, we won't get into semantics here too much. And then he goes on to model marks. Um, this is page 98. I think we started on page 95, 95 or 96. He only gives a few pages to it. And then he says, the troublesome markings occur most frequently in warm weather and when the plate has been longer than usual in the plate holder. Partial drying of the film is to some extent the cause and dirt on the plate, which would have no effect when the plate was used quickly, might <clears throat> set up the deposit in warm weather during long exposure. And that's all he really says. And then he gives an example. You can look, download this book. You can look. It's just a hand drawn. It's a kind of a terrible example. That's why I did put it in here. And then he ends his discussion on positives. So obviously he had more interest and more concern with making negatives and prints. And if you look at this book, it's 514 pages long. It's incredible that this is, this is the only amount of time dedicated to positive images. But you've got to remember, these guys were commercial photographers, right? These guys needed to make money. How do you make money? You can't make money making one-offs. You know, and they're gone, they're gone. You, you do all that work and you give the positive away, it's gone. You do all that work and you have a negative, you can make print after print after print. And, and most of the time, multiple pop processes or pr printing out processes, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to do that. So I just found it interesting that he spent so little time on um, positives and a massive amount of time on negatives. Um, so it, it, in the, at the end of the day, you, you find yourself um, looking at history, um, seeing how, how, uh, how these guys thought about and viewed the process. And, and a lot of times you're, you're just going to see this overwhelming, um, uh, overwhelming bias toward the negative. And those are the reasons why, because you have, a business to run and you're not making personal artwork and you're not, you know, posting it on Facebook and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You're trying to make a living doing this. Negatives to do that. When a lot of making, you know, X amount of time. And it's because more of the commercial reasons. Um, and I do, I have to admit, uh, looking back, I've had a couple of major shows and, um, one big regret I have is not making more negatives because those plates are gone. I'll never have them again. They're sold. They're gone. I have digital copies of them, but that's, that's it. So something to think about and something to uh, consider as you look at the history of photography. 
Oh, uh, Jan says, uh, if the clothing mix is thin, the layer may be thinner, you lose tonal range. No, you, you actually don't, uh, Jan. What happened, what he's talking about there is you don't need to pull in all that silver. You don't need to lay down masses of, massive amounts of silver. You're making a positive using reflected light, very thin, very minimal. You don't want that buildup. That's overexposure, and that's not good for a positive. You're going to explode, exploit the range, the tonal range of the positive with the absolute thinnest exposure you can get. The least amount of silver and binder you can lay down on that will produce the best positive, guaranteed. Once you start building that silver up and you use reflected light, you're going to lose detail. And, and when you're in this for a certain amount of time, you're going to start cross-pollinating these variants and understanding that it makes sense from a chemical and a physics point of view of how this works. So, hello, Facebook user. Hi, all. Every, hello, everybody. Um, Karsten said, do you have any recommendations for dealing with the silver bath when taking photos outside? Does it get very dirty quickly? And shit? That's a great question, actually. Um, once you move outside, once you moved out of a controlled studio with this process, your life can get turned upside down real quick because there you start adding so many variables. Number one, <clears throat> you know, our earth is rotating and, and, you know, spinning and rotating kind of at the same time. Right. Um, so, so you're battling, you're chasing the light. So right off the bat, you've got this moving target of light. Secondly, you've got temperatures and, and, and environment like Karsten's uh, saying here. And then you've got um, potential wind or, uh, problems that you're going to you're going to blow stuff into your onto your plate or into your silver bath. Here we go back to last week. Remember when when the Alpha brothers said, "Ah, drain bottle for collodion. You can take it or leave it." Well, get outside, pour a plate, and watch that wind puff up all of a sudden and and blow a bunch of stuff onto your plate that then you have to drain. Do you want to drain that back into your original pour bottle? No. You want to put it in a drain bottle, but you're going to put be putting that stuff in your silver bath. To add, answer your question, no, you, you're going to be fine. You want to do extra maintenance on your bath if you have it outside a lot. The advantage is you're going to breathe that, a lot of those solvents off just by having your bath outside, which is a good thing, right? Uh, but secondly, you've got to watch those environmental issues. They'll pop up and you'll have all kinds of problems with your silver bath. You'll You'll, uh, uh, yeah, that's very intuitive because once you move outside, you will, uh, <clears throat> it's wonderful to do, but you have additional problems to mitigate or deal with or be concerned with going out, being outside. Um, Malik, filing back to cleaning the plate, I am offended by how messy the traditional process is. Do you have a contemporary hack? Um, are you taught, uh, explain just a little bit more about how messy are you talking about the calcium carbonate and the alcohol and all that stuff and the rotten stone or are you talking about uh okay um no i don't <laughs> i don't have a modern hack for that the problem with using modern detergents and cleaners and dishwashers and all kinds of stuff uh, while they may work fine you're going to end up having to wipe those off with alcohol at some point pure alcohol because that, that soap leaves a layer of stuff. I mean, remember last week, the, uh, the Al Alfred brother said, make sure you don't wash your flannel in any soap because you don't want that residue coming off on the plate. That's how sensitive this stuff is. The best way that I've found, and I've, uh, you know, I make negatives pretty much exclusively now, um, the best way that I've found to clean glass is calcium carbonate, distilled water, and alcohol. The calcium carbonate acts as like an 8,000 grit sandpaper. The alcohol is a great solvent to break down anything on the plate. And, and the distilled water carries all of it. And it's clean, PPM free, zero PPM, et cetera. That's the best advice I can give for cleaning plates. Go the old school, traditional way um, and, tr and, and go minimal, you know, go minimal. Uh, Pablo says, I often find my just washed and dry plates with some whitish leftovers. Yeah. And here's the thing. Here's the big, that's a great point too. Here's the big thing there. 
<clears throat> so you've cut your glass for your, your ambrotype. You've cut your glass. You've deburred it, desharpened it. You fit it in your plate holder. You know it fits. Then you sit down and you clean it with calcium carbonate, alcohol, and distilled water. You turn the plate up on the side, and that cup there sometimes will hold little bits of calcium carbonate. If you don't clean that, those white bits out of those little grooves and whatever you have going on there, and you put that down in your silver bath, <clears throat> your pH is going to skyrocket upward, right? Baking soda or calcium carbonate is like pH 13 or 14. I don't know what it is. It's very basic. And so you're going to jack your pH way high on your bath. And then a couple of plates later, you're going to be saying, what's wrong with my plates? You know, very good point, Pablo. That's a very good point. And I emphasize, again, in the videos and book and all that stuff, I emphasize, make sure you clean the edge of that plate off, all four edges, because you, you put a little bit of that in your bath, bye-bye. And not that it ruins your bath. You just have a bunch of work to do, right? And Jeffrey says, I pre-clean with old-fashioned cologne. Oh, yeah, there you go. Check this out. I pre-clean with old collodion and then use calcium carbonate water and alcohol. Man, <clears throat> if you have old collodion that you can use on your plates, you don't even have to do anything after that. Collodion, do you know what collodion is used for? Yes, you are absolutely correct. It's used to clean those gigantic telescope lenses. Oh my God. They lay a big piece of cheesecloth down on those lenses and they pour plain USP collodion out, let it dry and then peel that up. Nothing, that's the cleanest surface you can. If you could afford to clean every glass plate with collodion, you'd never have a plate peel, ever, 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 ever. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> and then, Paolo, what do you do after pouring your old, uh, your old collodion? You just wipe that shite off, brother. You just wipe it off. Yep, there you go. And that puppy's clean. If you could clean every plate with collodion, you'd be golden. It's way too expensive, right? I mean... I don't have that much old red collodion. And the old red collodion that I do have, I usually save it to pump my new collodion up a little bit or throw some in the bath or something like that, right? Um, Arnold says, um, no, uh, let, I'll just answer that right off the bat. No, that is not possible to add more salts to increase uh, ISO. Nothing will increase the speed or the ISO of collodion. Once you mix it together, that's your peak ISO, and it starts going down from there, no matter the recipe. Some go faster, some go slower, but they all start to degrade and slow down. The amount of salts, if you add more salts to your collodion, guess what's going to happen? You're going to eat up a whole bunch of silver in your silver bath. You're just going to waste a bunch of silver. That's, it's just going to suck onto the plate. It's not, you're just going to put more silver on the plate, which is, isn't going to do you any good. You want less silver for these positives. Great question, though. Great question, people. Not the first time that's been asked for sure. And then Oliver, we're going to look at some of Oliver's stuff here in a minute. I found that developing plates become more difficult the older the silver gets. Not only because of oysters or railing, does a developer has to be uh, tuned to the, edge, to the age. You know, here we go. Become uh, Oliver, explain that. Um, I think, well, you don't have to explain it. I'm going to show it to you in Oliver's presentation here. You're going to see what Oliver's talking about. Um, when he's talking about an old bath that you've worked hard, you've had 100 plates through it or 200 plates through it, why is developer so difficult to, to make work with that stuff? And we're, we're going to talk about that in, in his section, actually. And then Chopper says, hey, I haven't seen Chopper for a while. Good to see you. The final physical thickness of the clothing has no effect on the final image, correct? That is correct. You are absolutely correct. And you are very welcome. And then thank you for asking the questions. I, there, the only stupid question to ask in here is the one that you don't ask. That's the only stupid question, right? That old saying. So ask questions because, man, if I can help and I can answer or somebody else can in here, that's what we get together and do these group sessions for, right? We, we don't want to sit and try to communicate via email. Just get out here and, and, and do it. I encourage everybody to save their questions for um, the, the show on, on the weekend if they can, or send it to me. You don't even have to watch the show live, of course. Um, Ding, hello from Paris. Hello, hello. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Let's go back to the, to the presentation here. 
Here we go. Man, my graphics team are the bomb, right? Look at that. Look at that graphics. That, that graphics team. Kudos to my graphics team this week. They really did a great job for me. I am just, I love it. I love it. So let's, we're going to do technical questions and answers. And we've been doing a couple of them already. And, and feel free to uh, chime in. It doesn't have to be related to this. You can ask anything, catch up with whatever, and can be totally unrelated. One of the things going on this week with me has been silver bath, heating or boiling. We call it boiling, but um, you, I get so much pushback on this topic. It's unbelievable. I don't know if people have, you know, a death wish or they're just that stubborn and they just don't. Uh, I don't have any sun here. I can't sun my baths. I don't have, you know, whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of folks out there in this community, they're taking their silver bath, putting it on a hot plate and heating that stuff up. And a lot of them say they take it outside or they do, none of them have fume hoods. I've never seen a damn fume hood once uh, with these people, not one time. They, they think their backyard or their garage or whatever is sufficient and it's not, it is not. And I'm gonna explain this. Let's, let's look at Herr Ketterman here real quick. Ketterman. When the physical thickness of the clothing has no, uh, it is recommended to pour clothing just one on the, yeah, just one. Yeah, you don't double pour for sure. I've learned that you let the clothing run over the plate twice. Oh, no, no, no. Uh-uh. I don't know where you're learning that, but tell the person you're learning that, no, that, you no, you don't do that. Number one, it'll cause ridges. You're building up thick collodion. Uh, you just, no, period. You, no, you don't do that. But. I'm glad you offered that because there's probably more people out there doing that. Um, back to the AGCNO. What are silver fulminates? What is silver fulminate? Silver fulminate is probably one of the most dangerous and explosive compounds known to us. And it is crazy how little, uh, I've gotten emails before with a photo of a silver bath with little, uh, little balls at the bottom of the silver bath and people asking me, can I move this? Should I do this? I just boiled this and oh my God, duh. I hate getting that stuff. Please don't do this, but you can decide. This compound can be prepared by pouring a solution of silver nitrate in nitric acid into ethanol. Under careful control, the reaction conditions to avoid an explosion, right? And I cited all this stuff down there. You can look at it. The reaction is usually done at 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. At 30 degrees Celsius, the precipitate may not form. Oh, may not. Only very tiny amounts of silver fulminate should be prepared at once, as even the weight of the crystals can cause them to self-detonate. Another way to make silver fulminate is to react is to react silver carbonate with ammonia in solution. And then he goes on to say, silver fulminate can be prepared unintentionally when an acidic solution of silver nitrate comes into contact with alcohol. So what are the components for silver fulminate? Silver nitrate, nitric acid, and alcohol, period, and 80 degrees Celsius. That's it. Now, if you want to roll the dice and keep heating that silver bath up and because, okay, why do they do this? Why do, and if anybody's in here listening that does this, the, the reason you're doing it is to evaporate the solvents out. All the stuff we just talked about, 10, 15 minutes ago, that's the only reason you're doing that, right? They did it in the 19th century. I know we're going to talk about that, but that's why you're doing that. Why would you, because I don't have any sun. I don't want to let my silver bath sit in the sun for a day or two, or there's no sun here in, you know, 50 longitude north, whatever they're talking about. Um, at the end of the day, and I'm not going to go into how to make silver fulminate. I'm not even going to encourage you to. I'm just saying what's needed to create or potentially create this highly explosive volatile compound. And you can decide if you want to do this or not. Um, I said the other day on a, I think it was a Facebook post. Um, I said that if anybody ever got hurt or killed from this stuff, I don't know that I'd be part of the community much anymore. It's just because there's no need for this. There's absolutely no need for this. I know it's convenient and all that stuff, but it, there's just no need. Question, should I boil my silver bath? Let's look at history and let's read what Bill Jay, 
in dangers in the dark. Talk about boiling your silver bath back in the day. By the way, a fun fact, explosions were the number one cause of death for photographers in the 19th century. Number one cause, poison number two. Other explosions took place in the dark room because all photographers are not chemists, although they should be. This declaration is particularly valid in the 1860s and 70s when most photographers manufactured their own processing chemicals and attempted to recover the valuable silver from their used baths. This was usually achieved by boiling the solutions. Unfortunately, explosive compounds are created by silver nitrate in the presence of other chemicals, which could be and were added to the bath by the ignorant or unwary photographer. Some of these precipitates were so unstable, i.e. silver fulminate, that they could be detonated underwater. These explosions occurred not infrequently, according to the Photographic Times of 1871, and will blow up a whole factory, machinery and all. In, pap in a paper, this citation six there, in a paper read before the Photographic Society of Paris in that year, the renowned chemist photographer Devon not only spoke of the extremely dangerous practices of some photographers, but also demonstrated the explosive potential of some of their results. Wouldn't that have been fun to be there? The danger of silver, of boiling silver baths were further increased, right? Not just what they have in their bath normally by putting plates in, but now they're gonna start adding glycerin to the solution, which was meant to confer some technical advantage to the final image. This was a, debate, a debatable point and was merely a matter of personal preference until the silver bath containing the glycerin was boiled. The result, often the production of nitroglycerin. So there's another compound. You have silver fulminates, and then you add a little bit of glycerin in there, which glycerin will produce super clean plates, super high, good contrast, super and unbelievably good stuff. And I am saying, do not do that. Do not, period. Do not add glycerin to your bath. <clears throat> The danger was real enough for it to be a major topic of discussion at the 1874 convention of the American Photographic Association. Albert Southworth, you know, the, the famous, yeah, the famous Southworth and Haas studio in Boston was one of the few photographers who defended the addition of glycerin to the silver bath. He said that he had seen it in constant use in gallery where the average number of sitters was 70 daily, 70 portraits a day without any evil results, end quote. The majority disagreed, stating that many of them were only present to warn of the dangers because the mixture had caught fire before the explosive stage of the process. So all kinds of problems there. I don't know why anyone would need to do this. There are other ways to handle getting solvents out of your bath, right? There are other ways you can work that. You do not need to do that. I mean, I know there are people that do, and I'm telling you, once you have, um, once you have that uh, uh, problem, once you start, once you form, if you form those fulminates, if you form silver fulminate, you're screwed. You would have to call in an explosive demolitions team or something to get rid of that product, because if you moved it or jiggled it or whatever you could blow up the entire, you know, it just, it just sickens me to think about it. Uh, Facebook user, um, sw sh switching gears here for a second. Does the age of clothing mix cause fogging, no veiling, so the image comes with no contrast? No, um, not necessarily. What, what it is, is a little dance between your developer and your collodion and your silver bath. And if your collodion is highly iodized and you're using a new bath, that can be a problem. If you look on, um, if you look in my book, I give you this, this example of what that is. How do you match your collodion in your silver bath? But um, it's a little too extreme to go into here in the middle of the fulminate talk, but we'll, we'll, look, at, we'll look at it another time maybe. So uh, uh, Farid says, so a silver bath maintenance will work easy adding baking soda and sun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Um, yes, you can do that. That's ex that's as basic as it is. You're neutralizing the pH. Your pH is three or four in a positive bath, uh, five, four or five in a negative bath. You're bringing that to pH seven, which is neutrals. So what you're doing is you're adding a tiny bit of baking soda to neutralize that bath. 
fill it up with water to precipitate the iodides off, evaporate it off, and, and or add silver, and then re, readjust your pH. Yes, it's that simple for you. You got it. You got it. You got it. Um, so back to the fulminates. Yes, Jan, perfect. I, I was just going to get to that. Always have an extra bath. Always have at least one extra bath. I have six, six extra baths, and um, now I have a ton of extra silver nitrate because of my large bath. I have nine extra liters, but always have an extra bath. And like he, like Jan just said, that way you can put one or two in the window. If it takes five days or a week or whatever, you don't even care. It doesn't even matter, right? You you get in this flow of maintenance where you're not putting yourself in danger of things or your neighbors or your family or your pets and everybody else. You just don't need to do that. You just don't need to. And people will push back on me and say, Quinn, you're so adamant against this. You use KCN and cadmium bromide. You know, good point. That's a great, that's a great challenge to me. My, my response to that is, is that I can mitigate those dangers to a, to a large degree. I can mitigate handling KCN and I can mitigate handling CDBR because I've studied it. I have my blood checked. I have, there's all kinds of things I can do. I can't mitigate where that fulminate's going to form or not at, at 70 degrees or 80 degrees Celsius. I, I, how much acid I have, how much, and you do large plates and those baths, I guarantee you have enough of everything to, to, to create fulminates, all of it. Maybe smaller baths, you might be, a, quote, safe. I wouldn't say it, but uh, large baths, you're pouring massive amounts of solvents, massive amounts of, of nitric acid in your bath to, you know, to bring your pH right and all that. So you have enough going on there. You just, there's just no need to do that. So have an extra bath or two or three. That way you don't have to worry about saying, oh, I got to make photographs and I got to, you know, boil this stuff off. I got to get rid of these solvents. Any questions on silver fulminate? I hope you guys don't want to make it. I hope I hope no one here does that. I hope I hope no one sees the need to risk that. It's such a risk. You have no control over that. If somebody comes and tells me I don't want to handle ether, I don't know how to control the peroxides forming. I don't want to handle cadmium bromide. It's cancer causing, and I'm afraid I'll breathe it in. I don't know the right mask to wear. I don't want to handle potassium cyanide because it kills you immediately. So I don't know how to handle. So good. If, if you don't feel comfortable with it, do not do it. I know of no one that's given me any scientific data to refute the uh, formation of fulminates in our particular uh, process. In fact, I just gave you an example of the 19th century where they killed themselves and blew themselves up on a regular basis doing it. So I think the evidence is pretty strong on this side. And uh, at the end of the day, I think you'll find that you can do just fine with a couple extra baths, your son when you have it or not, and uh, and let the let the, the let the magic happen that way. Jan says, I sat on floor close to the air conditioning with hot airflow. Good. Yes, perfect. So Jan puts it right by his heater vent. That heat, that those solvents will come right off. You're, you, the only reason you need the sun is for the heat. The sun will also get all the organic or a lot of the organic materials. It'll kind of process out and fall to the bottom as black crap, that kind of thing. But but we're talking about solvents. That's why you're boiling the silver bath, right? So if anybody out there has good scientific data that says this is safe to do, please send it to me. Please let me look at it and review it. I'm hoping to change my position on this. I am. I am. But I'm not going to do that until there's evidence and, and scientific based evidence. I posted the other day, I couldn't care less about your opinion. If you do this and you think it's safe because you heard it or watched a YouTube video or something, I, I, I couldn't care less about that. That means nothing to me. All you're presenting is a big pro potential problem you're gonna have at some point in the future. So scientific data, good evidence, this can't be formed with these solutions, present it to me and I'll change my position. Um, as a teacher, you can do that. There you go. So let's go on to recommended reading. We like these, right? Recommended reading. I do. I like him. Um, I will never, I, I call him Mr. C. I will never try to pronounce this gentleman's last name. I'd never get it right. So I'm not even going to, 
I'll offend him and I don't want to offend him. I don't know if he's still alive. I think he might be. I call him Mr. C or Mahaley. This is a great book. I read this many, many moons ago, but it really, I've often always wondered as I get in the dark room and I don't have clocks or time or anything, I just totally lose all sense of, you know, I'm so involved in what I'm doing, right? That's, we call that flow, right? We call that getting into the groove. I just want to read this. As Flo says, the book, not, not a person, the book's called, Flo, the name of the book is Flow. As Flo says, quote, the best moments usually occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limit in an, a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. Optimal experience is thus something that we can make happen. And he says, flow is the zone, that most almost magical state of mind where you become completely absorbed in something very challenging, but possible because you are at the edge of your ability. That's the key word. You're pushing yourself to the point where, you know, mentally or physically, probably more mentally in our case, sometimes physically though, right? You're pushing yourself so hard that you, you know you can do it. This last year, I've been in flow many, many times. And it's uncomfortable sometimes because you are stretching yourself in new areas and new ways. But man, if you can get through that and, and, and make it happen, you know, you grow. You grow. That's what, that's what we're talking about. It takes all of your mental energy to make progress. You have to be so into that that you just lose all your focus, right? You have no spare cycles to think, am I doing this right? Or do we need to get milk on the way home? None of that stuff is in your head. Mr. C writes that flow is the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. That sounds like a lot of us. <laughs> I, most, most of the people in this community, and there are great people in this community, believe me, there are terrific people in this community. There's some bugger and a-holes too, but we'll push those to the side for a minute. But there are a lot of great people in this community, and you will find as you meet them physically or get to know them, or meet them in person, I should say, and get chatting with them, you'll find that you have similar, like, oh, I do that too. Oh my God, that happened. You know, you'll just start clicking on many levels. And a lot of this goes back to this, this growth. This is how we grow. This is what pushes our mind and our bodies to grow. You know, there's no sitting on the fence in life, in my opinion. You're either progressing, you're either evolving or devolving. There's no sitting on the fence. You're either evolving or devolving. So this is a great book for photographers and especially people working in processes like the wet collodion process to really understand how they're pushing themselves and what they're doing and get out there right on the edge. Almost you can't do it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give everything I can and you do it, you, you, you break these barriers down. It's wonderful. Um, uh, Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey says, I sometimes get into a zone when pouring plates that I forget to eat. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly right, right? Exactly, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, do I need milk on the way home? No, your mind is right there. There is the world doesn't exist outside. It's just it's a wonderful mental place to be. Um, <clears throat> let's go back. Uh, recently, I made. Uh, oh, he's talking about Barnes. We'll we'll go to that in just a second. Fareed, just one second. Sorry. Um, so there's a book. I recommend that book highly. It's a small book. You could probably read it in a weekend. I don't know. It might be a hundred pages or so. My, mine's a white cover. Pretty soon, this is my little office here. Pretty soon I'll have all my books up here and I'll just reach over and say this one. And I'll open it up and show you some marks and all that kind of good stuff. And, and then we'll end up going out in the dark room at some point in time too. Here's Oliver. Let's go to email this week. Oliver, <coughs> great gentleman in Deutschland, um, sent me this. I think you guys will find this uh, a really good example, especially if you're new to collode in, or if you're not um, even, but you'll find this uh, probably a good exercise in, I love it when people break down what they've done, what they've used, their environments and challenges and everything, and, and then want to know what's wrong. So 
uh, he greets me there. Uh, I, I appreciate that, Oliver. Uh, watch YouTube. Congrats. You're doing a really nice job. I thank you very much. Since 2017, he's working in wet place most of the time on aluminum. Pretty happy with the images. But I need to figure out what uh, myself what's going on sometimes with a diva called chemistry. I know. And she can be for sure. That's no doubt about that. I don't want to bother you at all, but this time I can't figure out what my mistake is, and I discovered two of them. No problem. You know, the community that, that I embrace and the great people in this community, that's what I want to do. You guys support me. You buy my book. You buy my videos. You, when I did workshops, you come to my workshops and all that stuff. So fire away. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Don't You're not bothering me at all. I want to help if I can. Number one, I'm using your developer, converted it to 25% vinegar. That's great. Right. So in my book, I give examples of, of restrainers you can use. You don't need glycial acidic acid or nitric acid necessarily. You just need a larger quantity of, of vinegar. A household vinegar, vinegar is usually around 10 percent. Um, but since a couple of weeks, I discovered tracks, he calls them, uh, after developing. I hadn't noticed them in the past. Maybe I'm getting too picky. I like clean looking plates without any tracks or anything. Absolutely. You know, the goal here is to make clean, good plates. Um, and, and and once you get the tools of the trade down, then that that is your that is in service to you, right? You're not in service to the process. The process is in service to you. So obviously, you want to master that. You want to get that down. That's really good, and that's what you want to do. Um, <clears throat> I poured the developer different. Nothing really happened. Picture attached. After the plates are varnished and dried, they have a slight red touch. They're not as neutral as they used to be four weeks ago. Nothing changed on my side except the clothing is getting older. Okay. Let's deal with the first one. Here's a nice portrait of a, a nice looking young lady. He did. And I'll show you the next slide. You can really see it here, but you can see on her forehead. Do I have my tools here? Here we go, pointer. You can see on her forehead here, a line going across. You can see up here, definitely even a stronger line. And when we get into the detail, you can see a big one that kind of curves around her face about right there. These are developer sweeps. So when you don't have enough alcohol in your developer or your baths been worked hard, we just talked about this. In fact, um, Alfred Brothers just mentioned this. The solution is to add a little alcohol to your developer. That's all you need to do. Um, and, and I say there, if your bath is, is new or relatively new, less than, you know, about 25, 8 by 10s or equivalent, start with 3% of the volume for alcohol in your developer. If it's worked hard, go with 4 to 5%. So if you had a, a leader, a developer, you might, and your bath's not worked very hard, you might start with 30 mils of alcohol in that developer. If it's worked hard, maybe 40 or 50 mils. Less is more. Less is more, though. <clears throat> and see, you see it here. This is a big, dark one. These are all differences where the developer has stopped and started again. Stop and start again. Developer sweeps. Really, really good example. And they're, they're not always like this or that one that was up here that's cut out of the frame. They're not always like this, like a dark, absolute line. A lot of times they're like this. Look at that. It's a different tone of her skin here versus here. Really important. And I thank Oliver for sharing that. I appreciate that. Is there any questions on, on Oliver's uh, stuff there? <clears throat> let's, let's jump over before we go to uh, Gilbert's. Uh, Farid said, recently I made a local fir tree varnish. That's that's great. That's what uh, Sandarak is. Um, gum Sandarak. After the last heating, I got quite a milky layer over my test. Yeah. Can this be cut beca because or wax? It, this might be because we use de-waxed flakes. Uh, de uh, milky layer over your plate would suggest um, some wa too much water. Too much water um, is what... That's what uh, Sandrak acts like. Um, I mean, uh, even even um, 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 lac, uh, shellac will do that as well, too. You'll get what's called drying dead or you'll get that milky layer. Um, if you ever see gum Sandrak and water come together that way, it's, it's blue. It, it doesn't like it at all. Water and gum Sandrak do not get along. Well, that's why you want to heat that plate up after you varnish it so you don't dry dead, right? We talked about that quite a bit. But... <clears throat> De-waxed flakes shouldn't give you uh, a problem. You don't have uh, the residue there. So you're very welcome, Oliver. Thank you for sharing. And send your send your emails to me. If you have stuff like this, send them along. Um, I think I'll do Paul's next week, um, but we'll 
we'll try to get through um, Gilbert's here. I just wanted to touch on this real quick. Gilbert was the gentleman, he's in Switzerland, that wanted to do, and, and forgive me, Gilbert, if I don't have this correct, but he has a local museum. He wanted to go in with limited light and, and make photographs of objects or the place itself, I'm not really sure, but he wanted to do something that he could preserve his plates, his wet clothing plates, so they wouldn't dry out. <clears throat> and the first week we went, uh, we talked about um, the Gamble's book. One of the weeks we talked about Gamble's book, he has a recipe in there for plate preservation. Well, he dug a little further and he found out that um, the uh, there's a whole process and I'm familiar with it. And I just wanted to, you can pause that or screenshot that and read it. But I just wanted to briefly talk to you about the Oxymel process and what Oxymel is. Um, and it totally makes sense, right? Oxymel is, uh, is acid and honey, basically. It's, 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 uh, you couldn't get a better, re, uh, better restrainer <laughs> and covering than Oxymel, a honey and acid together. And the ancient Greek word translates to exactly that. And it's a, it's a definition of an herbal extraction of vinegar and raw honey. So there you have a restraint, uh, 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 well, vinegar would be really an organic restrainer too, and honey's definitely an organic restrainer. But there you have two, honey will never dry out, and you have a restrainer in there. It totally makes sense when you start talking about um, uh, holding the value of the plate. He hasn't had much luck with it yet, but we'll... Uh, you can look that up too. Look at this slide, the Oxymel process in the Journal of Photographic Society. You can look that up and, and read about that if you're interested um, in doing this. This method of arresting evaporation from the surface of a collodionized plate was described by J. Llewellyn in April of 56. Oxymel is a mixture of vinegar and honey and plates covered with it were found to retain their good qualities for eight or 10 hours but the exposures were long, about six times more than for the ordinary wet collodion plate. So having said that, you may, you may lose, uh, your exposure times aren't gonna be very fast, but you won't dry out. So if you had to do a five or 10 or 20 minute exposure, who cares, right? Your plate will still perform. So um, at the end of the day, and, and I, haven't, I haven't had a need, uh, I've used glycerin for sure, not in my silver bath to preserve the wetness of the plate. Don't, don't conflate those two things. I'm, I'm not turning around and saying I'm adding glycerin to my silver bath. I'm not. I use gly glycerin, a 50-50 mix. And again, it's in my book. You can do that to preserve plates, to fix them in, back in your studio or wash them or whatever you need to do, just so they don't dry out. You really never want to let glass plates dry in the field because once you re-wet them, you have a tendency to pull them and lift them right off the plate, even if they're albuminized a lot of the time. So, and Farid says, uh, back to his varnishing questions. I see, so I'll add a bunch more fur resin. Yes, you could try it. That's exactly the solution to that, more, more fur resin. Exactly right, uh, Farid. What about glycerin? Um, I wouldn't use glycerin. I just, I, I just use the uh, resin uh, to balance it out with the, whatever amount of water you got going on there. So there's the book, uh, or there's the uh, source for that uh, particular um, uh, the Oxymel process. Read about it; it's it's interesting. Um, and if you're if you need you're in need of something like that, you can surely do that. And I didn't hear back from John and Christine Milliker. They are in the state of Maryland here in the United States on the, near the on the East Coast. I just wanted to give them a shout out. Um, they've talked about me on their program a couple of times, I think, and. Uh, uh, at least once, and he's had me, they've had me on their uh, their uh, photography club online, you know, so to speak, a few months ago, uh, let me do a little presentation, which was very nice. So they do a photography podcast. I, I love podcasts. I love listening to podcasts. So if you're interested, they're great people. Give them a listen, underareglow.com, um, John and Christine Milliker, and they work on a lot of different processes. Good people is, I don't know them personally, personally, but they seem like very good people. Um, oh, <laughs> Farid says, Farid clarified that. I meant glycerin to keep the plates moist. Yes, yes, you can do that, very much so. And you wash that off um, after you, it doesn't go in your silver bath. So yes, you're, you're completely correct about that. So that's all I have. 
that was a that was a bunch to pack in though right i mean that's a bunch of uh stuff going on in your head for a minute on outdoor shoots before going home before going home for the fix or did i mix it no yes you're right farid farid's asking if i take glycerin and mix half glycerin and half distilled or deionized water and i'm out in the field and i have a little bottle of that and i just uh processed a plate and, I'm, and, it, and it just came out from the wash pan to go into the fix, you can stop right there and pour glycerin on that plate, glycerin water on that plate, and save it until you get home. It'll remain wet. It won't dry out. You can wash the glycerin and water off, put it in your fix at home, wash it at home, varnish it at home, all that stuff. You're correct, Fareed. That's, that's exactly right. So good stuff. Anything else? Anybody got anything? Um, I will get to Paul's, uh, Paul Smith in the UK. He sent a, a very nice email this morning showing some progress he's doing. I just love seeing people progressing in this and learning about it, looking at their mistakes. They're calling out, this is what I did and this is what happened. And just, it's a great thing to see in, in the community, people doing that. So that is what I have for today. If you do not have anything else, I'm going to stop this. If you don't have anything else, we will probably call that a golden day. Um, I hope you got something out of it. I hope you enjoyed it. We had quite a large group in here today, believe it or not. I can't believe how large that group got, but that's a good thing. I hope, uh, I hope you got something out of it, and I hope uh, you'll come back and visit next week. Um, I don't have anything planned right now. Um, maybe I got to go hang some ceiling fans in our house today, so um, get, the, get the old traditional um air moving hey thank you steve wilson great show cute greetings from kc well greetings to you it's good to see you guys coca-cola works too yeah coca-cola sure coca any 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 syrup any sugar any uh beer honey molasses uh i like glycerin <laughs> i like glycerin. It, it works really well so but yeah you, you know i'm giving you um the very you know kind of Straight, straight through shot. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for everybody attending today. Join me next week. We'll uh, we'll see what email comes in this week. Um, I've got a book, but I just wanna I, I want to make sure I get time to to excerpt because I got to go into the PDF. I have my iMac down here now. It's just not set up. I don't have my desk yet in my office, but I'll get all that stuff going on and I'll get back to normal. So somebody asked me this today. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't here. So they said, when are you going to have your studio um, and, and, and dark room up? Let me give you, I'll close with this, uh, or I'll give you this and you can chew on it for a minute. The next, the next phase of our house is complete here. We have water, we have heat, we have lights, so it's livable, um, which is nice. And that was quite a process to get there, but we do. So the next project now is uh, next week, we're going to do the uh, excavation and landscaping around. And when that's done, I'll be able, the first building I'm putting up is going to be our greenhouse. So I'll put a greenhouse up in February. The, love, the place for my studio and darkroom will be leveled as well. And I'll put the forms in for that. So I'll probably do my studio and darkroom in March. So I'll have my darkroom back up. And this is an interesting um, kind of note. I'm using, it's what it was, it, a, a, a guy named Tim here in Colorado uh, messaged me and asked if I'd put my studio uh, up yet. I said, no, that, that's, that's coming here in the next 60 days. And he asked what I'm using for light, right, for my Northlit studio. So I got a big piece of glass on the wall and I got one coming up the side like this. And I'm using, I sent him the link, I'm using this really high tech advanced um, poly plastic base at less 98% of the UVA and B through, which is really high content for that. And of course, they'll be scrimmed as well, too. But that's what I'm putting up. I'll have a North Lit studio and a dark room behind that, a little, little area. It's a 20 by 30 foot building, it's 600 square feet. Um, and to my knowledge, and you guys can check this out and tell me if I'm wrong or not, to my knowledge, I'll have the highest in elevation which means a lot, highest in elevation Northlet studio in the world at almost 9,000 feet, 22,800 meters above sea level. What does that, why does that mean anything? 
Well, you're closer. We don't have any. We have all pure UV. Watch these images. Watch what this Colorado sky produces in my studio. It will be mind boggling what that amount of UV will put through. It's gonna be fantastic and I can't wait. And then another thing, um, and this again, I was talking to somebody, I'm starting a project, that project this year called Red Mother Earth is what I've te te tentatively called it. And I'm gonna uh, photograph these rock formations, these sacred Indian rock formations in my area here in the very county that I live in. There's a huge Ute tradition here. The Utes lived on this mountain. This is, it's called Navajo Mountain Mesa where I live, but the Utes lived here. And I'm gonna photograph these sacred rock formations. And I told you that I'm gonna transfer them. I'm gonna do oil on glass, oil, Rollins oil print on glass plates. It'll probably be whole plate size. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do colored oil prints and I'm gonna color them with a slight uh, Colorado, like you know, red, brown color to mimic. They look like old autochromes. So they're oil prints on glass that are colored. I, I just, man, I, it keeps me up at night thinking about this. I love it. It'll probably take me a couple of years to do all, uh, to do that, but, or you'll see, you'll see prints, you'll see glass plates on this show before the summer's over for sure. So you guys can give me some feedback on them. So uh, great. Thank you, Errol. Thank you. Uh, Molly Geff. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Oh, please call me Quinn. Mr. Jacobson is my father. Thank you, though. Um, and I'll just caught the end here in Australia. Oh, it's 5.15 a.m. Sunday. Well, good morning. Uh, we'll be sure to tune in from the beginning next time. And you can always watch it. You know, it's on it's on YouTube. So you go to my YouTube channel and you can watch it later. Molly, some lady I slugging for shooter in Australia. Get to me on Facebook, please. Oh. So personal message. Thank you, Thilo. Good to see you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. White glass, Quinn? No, nope, just clear glass. I'm going to do clear glass. And I'll, I don't know what I'll back them with yet. We'll, we'll play some discovery stuff on that. But welcome, welcome, welcome. I am excited. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciated your support. I hope you join me next Saturday. It's always good to see these familiar faces. I love it. Ciao, ciao. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and don't get sick. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.